Uh, let's talk about what is happening uh, in uh, the Sudan. Uh, it is one of the stories that does not get the same level of attention as what's happening in Ukraine or even Israel in Gaza. More than a year ago, Sudan's civil war began. According to humanitarian organizations, the East African country now has the world's largest displacement crisis. The fighting has forced more than 8 million people to flee their homes in the past year. The majority of the country needs humanitarian assistance and there's a risk of famine. Groups estimate the conflict has killed at least 14,000 people, but the actual number could be much higher. National security and foreign policy expert Asha Castleberry Hernandez joins us right now. Glad to have you here. Uh, so uh, for folks who don't know, what's going on here? Because you, people, all, remember, people also don't realize that the country actually was split into two countries. Yes, Roland, thank you so much for having me today. Yes, it was split between two countries. In fact, that that development was actually historic to me because I was actually at the United Nations when that happened, uh, working at the Security Council under the Obama administration representing the U.S. mission to the United Nations. So Sudan and South Sudan were split in between the two. And after that development, unfortunately, uh, Omar Bashir, the, uh, the head of the leadership of Sudan just continue to uh, pursue oppressive policies against South Sudan, exacerbating humanitarian conditions, also creating more tensions between uh, the two forces, which is RSF and SAF. So what you're starting to see is just a rollout of all those oppressive policies and the outcomes that are spilling into a decade later, which is, uh, you know, going into 2022, where ongoing tensions between these two efforts where they tried to merge the two, but unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the uh, international community was just pretty much distracted with other conflicts, deprioritizing this one. So what, in terms of what actually is the conflict? Who's battling who? And what external forces are trying to re uh, mediate or, 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 or stop what's happening? Yes, thank you for the question. So the regional security forces, which represents Sudan, is uh, battling uh, the South, um, the um, Sudanese armed forces, which accused them of, of, of pursuing a coup against Omar Belashar and, uh, and, and made many attempts beyond that point. So those two are at, at um, are going back and forth. And what you're seeing in terms of external uh, influences or support is coming from different countries like Russia. And, and UAE, where they're popping up, the RSF. Uh, the United States even tried to work very closely with the two to, to call on um, some sort of ceasefire in terms of the fighting, like you had in April 2023, where uh, uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken came in and spoke with the RSF leadership to, to call off the uh, the fighting. But unfortunately, that uh, those negotiations continue, but Again, it lost attention by October 23 because we know what happened in October 2023, which was the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict. Questions from the panel. Uh, Gavin, you're first. Uh, Asha, thank you very much for joining us um, and for shedding light on the situation. I think it's really sad that you alluded to it. I mean, I think the mainstream media has largely ignored this conflict, even going back before October, I feel like. So thank you for being here to educate all of us. And Roland, thank you for making sure we talk about um, this issue. So Asha, I think my question for you is, I think reflexively, we see a situation like this playing out. And, you know, we... I think rightfully wonder what the U.S., what other countries can do for the people who are in this situation, whether that's aid or sort of other assistance. However, at the same time, we know that oftentimes the way the West sort of approaches aid and humanitarian relief can often be kind of problematic. And so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts um, that you can share with us about you know, how you see the role of the United States and other Western nations in supporting uh, folks in this situation and, and similar ones? Yes. Well, if you look at the recent comments from um, uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres, he is saying that there's a lack of funding towards the humanitarian efforts in, uh, in Sudan. So we need more funding. Unfortunately, the reality is, is that there might be uh, a a balance and act issue here where we put more funding into Ukraine, more funding into the Israel Hamas conflict. And now you have this uh, this situation in Sudan. So 
But they did just uh, host a donors conference calling on for more aid. And then you have other middle powers like the Saudi Arabia trying to step up their game and providing assistance. Uh, the French trying to mediate uh, in this situation too as well. But I believe that there has been a lack of attention in terms of providing hum more humanitarian assistance because there's so much attention with regards to Ukraine and Israel-Hamas conflict. Rebecca, if I could follow up. I'm really sorry. Quick, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, quick follow up question on that, Asha. So I think I remember hearing from another expert on the region talk about how, in many cases, unfortunately, like aid that gets sent to uh, African nations can sometimes not actually reach the people who need it most. You know, the aid might go toward uh, United States based, um, you know, contractors <laughs> who then sort of go into the region and kind of can spend the money as they see fit. So I guess. I'm wondering if you could sort of help me understand and perhaps help, you know, the listeners understand when we talk about aid, like what is really the flow, right, of resources and how can we make sure that that aid actually goes to the people and the places that need it most? Yes. Well, we first need to reach out to those organizations that are not involved in any corruption and that it makes it to them and to the people. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the African continent has been known for corrupt activities activities and one of them is mismanaging money and make it mm -hmm. and as a result of that that money not reach it to the people so one way to get around it is uh providing more money to the ngos uh, the ngo community that has direct access to the people also to international organizations that can uh, funnel that money directly to the people and it just it needs accountability but unfortunately when it goes when the money the funding goes from there to actual government, it's a hit or miss if the people get it. And unfortunately, it's a, just a long history of it not reaching to the people because of corruption. Thank you. Rebecca. Aside from um, giving humanitarian aid, um, what role can the U.S. play in stopping the ethnic cleansing? Yes, I, I think it, it, the United States needs to go back to what they were doing in um, April 2023, where they put, they actually uh, deployed their top leadership to work very closely with the RSF um, as well as the ASF uh, to reach some sort of mediation. If the United States can it cannot or no longer play that part, they have to find a influencer in the regional community, in the international community, to play a part. Like for instance, the Saudi, Saudi Arabia could be a possibility. Um, also, if it's the French, that could be another possibility. But if the United States cannot do it, we need another regional influencer or, inter or strong international actor to help reach some sort of mediation uh, as soon as possible. Robert? Uh, I've heard from many international observers this conceptualization of Africa fatigue, uh, that if you talk about the uh, genocide currently going on in the uh, the eastern part of the Congo, uh, the uh, subjugation of gay rights in Uganda, uh, Somalia attempting to split into two nations, uh, Ethiopia threatening to annex Eritrea, uh, and still the remnants of the Tigray rebellion, uh, Egypt threatening to bomb the Millennial Dam over river uh, uh, water rights on the Nile River, the uh, situation in uh, Sudan, perhaps splitting again into two nations. Libya uh, on the verge of splitting the two nations while also dealing with the damage of uh, the dam uh, the dam breach would kill 20,000 people. Uh, the Sahel region, where you have the uh, kicking out of the CFA franc and the uh, forming of the CFA confederation and narrowly averting a, a war between uh, the Sahel nations and ECOWAS. How can you talk to Western observers and Western people, particularly in the U.S., about why they can, should not get tired and quote unquote fatigued with dealing with issues on the African continent? Oh, that's a really uh, great question. Um, first and foremost, I would say that, um, and thank you for the breakdown, uh, a way to kind of acknowledge this as much as possible as or approaching the ongoing conflicts from, from Western Africa all the way to the East, East Horn of Africa is that we have to prioritize this as much as possible. It needs enough media coverage. Uh, I think... Um, the House Committee on Foreign Affairs does a really good job in bringing more attention to it at times. Uh, and as far as being overwhelmed with it, um, I think that in order to like overcome that perception, we have to have some sort of pride in the future of Africa and how that directly impacts us at home. And if we don't have that pride, you know, we're going to lose out on really keeping the finger on the pulse and, and just easily be overwhelmed with the issues involving the African continent. Um, like, for instance, if you see what's going on in Haiti, 
uh, there's a lot of intention right now where we are saying uh, not only should we pro provide continuous funding to Ukraine as well as Israel, Hamas issue, we should also make sure we fund Haiti. And we have to treat the African continent with regards to their issues the same way, where you see on national media that it's important to provide more funding to humanitarian assistance. A perfect example of that is during the Bush administration, where uh, uh, President Bush gave money to Darfur conflict and they said, why did you do that, President Bush? He said, because I kept seeing it on TV, the depictions, and I was just horrified about that, and that impacted me. So we need more coverage when it comes to the, to the uh, uh, covering the uh, conflicts in Africa. And just brief follow-up real quickly. Uh, what impact do you think uh, the Chinese investment in Africa should have? We've seen in the last decade through the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the New Silk Road, uh, building ports around Africa, building parliament buildings, airports, et cetera, uh, creating this system where they will have access to the uh, the rare earth elements and the, the uh, resources of the future um, through these debt traps that are happening internationally. Uh, for American audiences, can you explain the importance of this geopolitical battle between the United States for uh, hegemonic and control over the African continent, particularly them having the youngest population on Earth. Uh, the second half of this century will be the African century, the average population being 19 years old in the, on the continent. Oh, love! I love the question. Um, in fact, I forgot to mention that as the role of the, the PRC or the Chinese in the continent, uh, the PRC has been able to use their Belt and Road Initiative as a way to leverage political affairs over these different uh, countries in Africa. And in fact, as a as a first order, second order effect, the uh, United States has been, um, their influence towards these different conflicts uh, has been undermined because of the fact that Chinese has been effectively been able to, um, to place their strategic political interests over the African countries because of the, the investments coming from the BRI. Now, what we're seeing, not only you said, okay, you have these high interest rate diplomacy debt traps. Uh, we're also seeing the quality of the BRI has significantly deteriorated in many ways to where so many African countries are getting sick and tired of BRI projects. A good um, case analysis of that is, is right now in Kenya, where they first started their BRI. Uh, you're seeing the, the issues involving environmental uh, effects where it's hurting the, the, the local environment. So, um, so that is very significant, though, because, again, the PRC has been able to leverage the BRI over these countries or <coughs> influence when it comes to the political decision making when these conflicts uh, break out. And you will see where some of these, the leadership in these African countries will even go to the PRC before the United States for advice on how do I move forward uh, with this uh, conflict or this issue I'm having in my own country. All right, then. Well, hopefully uh, we will see uh, some positive development there. Uh, Asha, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Fanbase is pioneering a new era of social media for the creator economy. This next generation social media app with over 600,000 users is raising $17 million. And now is your chance to invest. For details on how to invest, visit startengine.com slash fanbase or scan the QR code. Another way we're giving you the freedom to be you without limits.